before, David Lubin is, uh, is a professor, is a scholar of ethics, philosophy, and international criminal law, and has been a distinguished university professor at the Georgetown University Law Center, but also has been, uh, he holds the chair in ethics at the United Na States Naval Academy. Apart from that, um, David is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's a distinguished senior fellow at the National Institute of Military Justice and recipient of the Sharif Bashuni Justice Award for Outstanding Service to the Study of Core International Crimes. His 2014 book, Torture, Power and Law, published by Cambridge University Press, won the American Publicist Award for Scholarly Excellence in Philosophy. Today, we're very happy because David is going to address a very interesting theme, discussing the four puzzles of aggression and accountability. Without any further delay, David, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and you have the floor. Thank you very much. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I just want to double check that everybody can hear me. Yes, okay. we can. Okay, so uh, you know, before February of uh, 2022, when I was teaching my international criminal law class, I, I really spent very little time uh, discussing the crime of aggression. Um, I would give uh, my students a bit of history of uh, how it uh, came about in the Nuremberg Charter, um, a bit about uh, why the, uh, the, the states parties in the Rome Statute of the ICC had a very hard time coming up with a definition that was acceptable to everybody, which they finally did in 2010 in uh, the Kampala Amendments. I would talk a little bit about how the definition they uh, came up with is very toothless. And I would uh, then talk a little bit about uh, the complexity of cyber aggression and figuring out the legal issues around that. Uh, and, but it, it, the topic didn't, I mean, it seemed a little abstract because nobody seemed to be interested in prosecuting anyone for aggression. And more importantly, the whole idea that there could be a full-fledged overt military invasion for purposes of conquering territory just seemed like a thing of the past. Well, Obviously, all of that changed in February of 2022, and uh, uh, the reaction was really quite remarkable. Uh, the UN General Assembly voted twice by very large majorities uh, to denounce the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine as aggression. Uh, and for the next uh, year or so, uh, the jurists were going into overdrive, trying to figure out if there was an accountability mechanism. So, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it turns out that there, the crime of aggression actually has a very complex legal history that creates some deep puzzles that are both legal and conceptual. And I want to talk about four of those puzzles today. The first has uh, to do with the question of what exactly is the nature of the evil that makes aggression a core crime? That is, we understand why genocide and war crimes and crimes against humanity are, uh, so to speak, in the pantheon of core crimes uh, because uh, they are uh, written in innocent blood. Why are acts of aggression up there in the same pantheon? Uh, the second is the question of uh, who do you prosecute for the crime of aggression? Uh, from Nuremberg on, it's always been understood as a leadership crime. We prosecute leaders. Nobody dreamed of prosecuting entire invading armies. But the question came up of uh, who counts as a leader? You know, so for example, suppose that Ukraine managed to capture a Russian three-star general. Uh, uh, would that person count as a leader who could be prosecuted for aggression? Uh, how about uh, civilians? Uh, so suppose that the Prigozhin had lived and the Wagner group was still active. Uh, could he be uh, prosecuted uh, for aggression? How about uh, arms manufacturers, uh, uh, other industrialists? Uh, some German industrialists were prosecuted in the second round of Nuremberg trials. So who counts as a leader is the second question. The third is uh, something that I'm going to call the paradox of immunity. Um, a very natural candidate uh, for uh, who might indict 
Russian leaders for aggression is Ukraine, which is the victim state. Uh, it has a, a domestic crime of aggression in its statute book. Uh, so does Russia. So there's no problem of dual criminality. So does Belarus. Um, and even if the indictment only has symbolic value, because obviously um, the, the prospect of actually capturing uh, the Russian leadership is fanciful. Um, a lot of uh, the fate of Ukraine turns on world public opinion and the possibility of a legitimate indictment um, might make that a very attractive prospect. The problem is that under established international law, heads of state and heads of government um, and foreign ministers, um, possibly other high officials, are immune from prosecution in the states of another court. So that's the paradox. The paradox is that aggression is a, a leadership crime. Leaders are the ones that are immune from prosecution in national courts. So it just seems like uh, uh, this, this is just self-defeating legal doctrine. Um, it turns the doctrines into playthings. Now, leaders aren't immune from prosecution in international tribunals, um, but the, uh, the natural one, the International Criminal Court, has no jurisdiction over uh, the crime of aggression. Um, even if uh, Ukraine is able to grant, uh, grant jurisdiction over other war crimes and crimes against humanity and genocide, not over the crime of aggression, and there aren't any other international tribunals. So that's going to take us to the fourth puzzle. There have been serious proposals uh, to create an international aggression tribunal. There is a proposal by the European Commission, the United States government, which long opposed any activation of the crime of aggression you know, for uh, um, the, the embarrassing reason that the U.S. likes to use force all over the place, um, suddenly did an, uh, uh, an about face. And uh, um, the, our ambassador for global criminal justice, Abeth Van Skak, uh, announced publicly a year ago in April that the U.S. supported uh, an international aggression tribunal. The governments of Lithuania and Estonia uh, th thought this would be a good idea. I mean, they obviously see themselves as uh, potential tidbits that could also be gobbled up by Russian aggression. But that just pushes the question back to uh, what is it that makes a tribunal international? Uh, what makes it a plausible surrogate for the quote unquote international community? Now, the, the International Criminal Court can make that claim. Uh, it has 124 members. Uh, they come from every continent. Membership is open to all states. So that's a very embracing international tribunal. Um, so but look at the other extreme. Suppose uh, could just two states create a tribunal through a bilateral treaty and say, OK, we now have an international tribunal and we are going to indict for the crime of aggression. Well, you'd better watch out. Those two states might be Russia and Belarus and they might decide to prosecute Volodymyr Zelensky. So just to summarize uh, what the, the four puzzles are, uh, what's the evil of aggression? Who are the leaders that can be prosecuted for aggression? Are the only people can be pro who can be prosecuted in national courts immune from prosecution? And if you want to elevate it to an international tribunal, which would be created from scratch, uh, what is it that entitles it to call itself international and therefore say uh, there's no immunity from prosecution? Now, what I want to do is to offer some answers to all of these puzzles. So let's just turn to the first one. What's the special evil of aggression? Uh, in standard international law, aggression is defined as a crime not against human beings, but against sovereign states. Um, on this, uh, uh, the uh, General Assembly agrees. The International Law Commission agrees in its uh, um, articles on responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts. Uh, the Rome Statute agrees. Uh, the General Assembly calls aggression an affront to uh, the, quote, personality of a state. 
Now, to me, though, the problem is that states don't have personalities, and uh, we don't want to tr reify the idea of state sovereignty and make it some kind of a mysterious ding on you know, thing in itself that uh, uh, now, because this, uh, this abstraction, this legal fiction has been attacked, that makes this one of the most serious crime. Why? So the question here is, why does assaulting a state uh, make aggression part of the pantheon of great evils? Crimes against humanity and war crimes kill people. Genocide kills peoples. States are neither, they don't kill, they don't buy them. They're not uh, the kind of things that's a victim. Now, um, there have been excellent scholars who uh, have tried to answer this question, and I my answer builds on their work. And uh, here I'm thinking of Tom Dannenbaum uh, and uh, Fred uh, McGray. Uh, um, so both of them focus not on the offense against states um, or against state self-determination. Um, what they focus on is the violence that aggression unleashes. So even uh, even if the war is fought, uh, so to speak, cleanly within the, the rules of the use in Bello, which uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has not. But uh, let's just take as a hypothesis that it's fought cleanly so that there aren't any war crimes being committed. Uh, there still is violence that is going on. The, uh, the invader has uh, forced the victim country to put its young men and women on the line to fight off the aggressor. Um, the aggressor state is putting its own soldiers' lives on the line, and we know that Russia has sacrificed hundreds of thousands of lives in its attacks on the Ukraine. So uh, th that's it. I mean, we, we can now say that's the evil of aggression. It's the violent stupid might be one way of putting it. Now, that opens its way to a, an a, a objection an aggression could be bloodless. Uh, when Hitler conquers Austria and Czechoslovakia, I mean, they just give up because they don't want the fight. Um, so how, how does that work? Well, Dannenbaum has the, the view that uh, a bloodless aggression is illegal, but it, it shouldn't be a crime. Uh, I don't agree with that. Because I think that even a bloodless aggression is almost certainly going to end up with blood on the streets. Uh, the in invaders usually do not have uh, benign intentions toward the invaded population. An occupation by force is going to get a, a, an insurgency. It's going to get a resistance. Uh, that insurgency will have to be repressed. The occupation will have to be maintained by force, and it's pretty clear that what began bloodlessly is not going to stay bloodless for for long. And uh, I think that there is a, a a tradition going back to John Locke that um, you know it may be that the the armed robber who says your money or your life but doesn't take my life um, is uh, you know ha has not uh, actually harmed me. But the risk is always there, and that risk is likely to materialize. So in short, I, wanted, I want to take a human rights focus to the crime of aggression. Uh, the crime of aggression inflicts violence on human beings, and that's why it belongs in the pantheon of great evils. Uh, now, when, uh, at Nuremberg, the crime of aggression was uh, defined as a crime against peace. And so another candidate besides crimes against states is crimes against peace. Can that be assimilated to this human rights paradigm? I think that in an age of thermonuclear weapons and of conventional weapons of absolutely devastating power, the answer is clearly yes. Uh, anything that is destabilizing the peace is putting human rights in enormous jeopardy. So uh, my answer to the first puzzle is think about the crime of aggression, not as an attack on states, the abstraction, or on peace, the abstraction. Think about it as an attack on actual living human beings and their human rights. So let's turn to the second puzzle. Who's the leader 
uh, who can be prosecuted. Now, I mean, the background here is obvious. Everybody agrees that the foot soldiers in the Russian army shouldn't be prosecuted as aggressors. I mean, there, there actually were a couple of uh, captures of uh, Russian soldiers by Ukraine who did prosecute them for aggression, but those were kind of anomalies and they were very quickly traded. There was a prisoner swap. Uh, and I don't think that uh, the Ukrainians uh, have any intention of prosecuting the POWs for aggression. So I'm going to ask a, a funny question. It seems obvious you shouldn't prosecute foot soldiers, but why not? I mean, think about this in criminal law terms. If a soldier knows that the war is aggressive and therefore a violation of international law, and that soldier is killing and breaking things, while committing aggression, you have actus reus, you have mens rea. What more do you want to say that it's a crime? Now, let me be clear, I'm not suggesting that armies should be prosecuted. Uh, I think that there are very good reasons for amnestying uh, all the foot soldiers. But if you think about it conceptually, uh, you can't amnesty unless you think that there's a crime to amnesty from. So the, the idea that the soldiers are amnestied so that they aren't prosecuted is not the same thing as saying that they actually don't have criminal liability. Now, why, why is this important? It matters because uh, of uh, how it frames the leadership question. Um, there are many international law scholars who assume that only the apex leaders can count as leaders. And they're very suspicious of any effort to move down the food chain um, and broaden the circle of liability. Uh, so they're asking constantly, well, what justifies a wider leadership requirement? Once we recognize that even foot soldiers who are being amnestied uh, still may be criminally liable. We understand that the right question isn't what justifies the wide leadership requirement. The right question is what justifies a narrow one. Now, this turned out to be a major issue in, in the Kampala process that created uh, the ICC's definition, the Rome Statute definition of aggression. Uh, before that, the customary international law test of leadership from Nuremberg on was that a leader is somebody who has the ability to shape or influence the policy to commit acts of aggression. Uh, at Kampala, the wording was changed from shaping or influencing to uh, a leader is somebody who can control or direct the aggressive action. Now, intuitively, that seems to narrow it. Um, there might be people who are in no position to control or direct the aggression because they don't give the final command, who could still shape or influence the leader's decision. Uh, a, an, an arms manufacturer who can't supply the arms might shape or influence that decision. A trusted advisor might shape or influence that decision. So it seems as if for some reason or other uh, at Kampala they decided to narrow the definition of who counts as a leader. Now, there's a kind of interesting sideline to this, which is that some of the people who are actually involved in the drafting process have said that was not our intention at all. And uh, um, there's uh, an excellent article by uh, the young scholar uh, Nick Hayden, uh, who is, argues that uh, actually you can read the controller direct uh, language uh, as being not much different from shape or influence. But in the end, I don't think that's going to matter because as states begin, especially the members of the, uh, of the ICC, uh, parties to the Rome Statute, as they begin to change their own domestic criminal codes, uh, military codes of justice to incorporate uh, the Rome Statute language, they might very well interpret it as uh, narrowing um, in the narrow way that only apex leaders can be prosecuted and states have a big incentive to do that. And the incentive is that it would make it easier for them to recruit nervous, uh, you know, nervous big shots to the enterprise um, because you can say, oh, you're not going to be liable should we lose the war. And why do we want to uh, give states an incentive to do that?
So I'm going to argue for here that uh, whatever the vault ultimate test is, it should be a wide range of leadership. Shape and influence sounds like a pretty good definition, uh, taken quite literally, not merely those who can, can control or direct, but anybody who might be able to influence uh, a, an aggressive and an aggression minded leader uh, to not commit acts of aggression. Uh, counts as a leader themselves. So now let's turn to the third puzzle, which is what I've called the paradox of immunity. Uh, it's pretty clear, no matter how much we widen it, that the most culpable aggressors are the apex leaders. Now, under customary international law, uh, the so-called troika, head of state, head of government, minister of foreign affairs, um, are all immune from prosecution in the courts of another state you know, under the, the old legal principle that equals have no dominion over equals. Um, France has expressed the view that defense ministers are also up there with the Troika. Uh, so that means that uh, Ukraine could not legitimately prosecute them. And uh, so let me just pause for a moment, uh, or digress for a moment. I think that Ukrainian prosecutors uh, who are trying to figure out who to prosecute uh, have a, a concern for international legitimacy of anything that they do. So they are not going to deviate much, if at all, from received mainstream international law because doing so would lose them legitimacy. So here the, the question is this, and it's been raised many times in, uh, in other litigations. Suppose we have a customary international law of immunity for the Troika and other top leaders. Does that apply even when the crime at issue is one of the core international crimes, what we call a use Kogan's offense? Um, that issue has been litigated twice in the International Court of Justice, um, twice, maybe three times even, in uh, the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, uh, infuriatingly to me, all these courts said, well, we've searched and searched to find a use Kogan subject, exception to the rule of immunity. We can't find one. Now, that's controversial. The International Law Commission has pushed back on this. In 2017, uh, it adopted uh, draft articles um, on immunity that uh, exempted some core crimes from, uh, uh, from at least one kind of immunity. Um, Interestingly enough, those articles did not cover the crime of aggression. And that was controversial. It led to the only divided vote ever uh, in the International Law Commission. Um, and uh, it may be revisited at some point in the future. Uh, but the, the rapporteurs who wrote these draft articles were very candid. They said, you know, this, would, uh, this might disrupt international relations if we criminalized aggression. And, you know, of course, the pushback is uh, maybe aggressive war also isn't so great for international relations. Now, my argument here uh, is that all of these decisions assume there is a customary immunity from the crime of aggression. Uh, that is, all of them start from the assumption that, uh, the core, that there's immunity for, core, for uh, in, in general, for leaders. Uh, they ask, is there a use Kogan's exception? They look at the legal materials, they say we can't find one. But look at the structure of the article, of the argument, they're just postulating um, that there is an immunity rule that applies to the crime of aggression. Uh, well, if you want to find, if, show me, show me the state practice of immunizing leaders for the crime of aggression. Show me the opinio juris to back it up. Well, when you look at the state practice, there is none. There were several prosecutions for the crime of aggression in post-World War II by national governments, uh, Poland, and actually Russia did some of those prosecutions. At the end of World War I, there was, uh, um, the Allies wanted to prosecute the Kaiser. Uh, they eventually decided for a variety of reasons not to, not to go forward with that, but there was a lot of legal discussion. Uh, so, and nobody ever immunized the Kaiser. So there is just no state practice 
of immunizing anyone from the crime of aggression. How about the opinio iuris, uh, uh, the, the, which is the, uh, um, the state opinion that the reason for a practice is that it's a legal requirement? Uh, well, if you look at the time of the deliberations, uh, can we try the Kaiser? The opinio iuris was not opposed or uniformly opposed, did not immunize. Uh, so both the French experts, Al Arnaud and Lapodel, the British experts, or Robert McDonnell, doubted that there was any rule of immunity for aggressive war. So here my answer is if there's no state practice, um, no opinio, no firm opinio juris, that there's an immunity for the crime of aggression, uh, then there, there is none. There is no such rule. Now, you might say that what I've just offered is a kind of silly lawyer's trick argument. Of course, there's no state practice of immunity. The crimes only existed since 1946. There have been no prosecution since 1948. That means that uh, this practice of, immun of immunity is zero out of zero. And that means nothing. Now, I disagree. Unlike all the other core crimes, where the courts have found immunity. Aggression is unique in that it strikes at the very heart of the entire UN post-war legal order. So that makes it a sui generis crime. And we simply should not suppose that the answer to the question uh, can be done by analogy with immunities for other for core crimes. Uh, so just to, to summarize, uh, if there's an, I don't believe there is a customary immunity of leaders for the crime of aggression. And that takes us to the fourth puzzle. Um, since from Nuremberg on, there have been no head of state immunities, no immunities at all before international tribunals. So the question is, suppose that some group of states, the EU, for example, wants to create a special tribunal for aggression um, uh, and say, well, there's no immunity before that. Uh, how do you do that? Well, there are many mechanisms by which an international tribunal can, can be created. The Security Council can create it, but obviously it won't because Russia has veto power. Um, China, its ally, has veto power. Uh, it's debated among scholars whether the General Assembly could create a tribunal. Um, the ICC is a, a treaty-based organization. It was created by a multilateral agreement. So uh, how big do you have to be? How many states have to be parties to the treaty before uh, an aggression tribunal can claim to be international? Now, there have been a couple of arguments about this. One is, look, none of these states by themselves can prosecute leaders because of the immunity rules. And uh, there's an ancient legal rule that you can't transfer a right that you don't have yourself. So can the states actually pool um, pool their jurisdiction and create it. Well, if none of them has the jurisdiction, they can't. Um, and and also, you know, like how many states would it take to, to claim to be spokespersons for the international community? Now, my solution just follows from my answer, my response to the third puzzle. We can cut the Gordian knot. If there is no customary rule of immunity, there's no obstacle to overcome. The deeper question is what gives the states the authority, a smaller group of states, the authority to say, we are the voice of humanity. We are the voice of the international community. Now, let's suppose that there were an EU created tribunal, just as an example. Here we have a sizable number of specially affected states. It's not just a handful of states. It's not just, let's say, Belgium and Luxembourg creating an international tribunal or Russia and Belarus. But what's more important is that in the case of the Russian invasion, the General Assembly has already declared that it is the crime of aggression, twice, by lopsided votes. So that creates a strong tailwind for saying um, any tribunal, uh, well, I'll qualify that in a moment, that a tribunal uh, does, can claim to be speaking for the international community. Now, why is it not any tribunal? This is, the real condition is that that tribunal has to be scrupulously fair. 
It has to provide not just ordinary legal process, but champagne quality due process. Uh, it has to, uh, it, you know, th this might include uh, strict ethics rules on the judges, no two judges from the same country, uh, many of the, the things that we've already seen on the international tribunals, uh, making sure that there's equality of arms in the legal process itself. Uh, all of the uh, human rights protections of fair trials are in place. Now, uh, I think, I mean, this is something that I've argued in uh, for many years is that uh, the legitimacy of international tribunals comes from their internal fairness of process, um, that they're not just uh, weird courts. I mean, it's not like uh, the Rolling Stones suddenly declaring, oh, we're creating an international tribunal and we're going to, I mean, that's, that would be silly. We need we obviously need states to do it and states that have capacity to provide legal process. That is the legitimacy. Now, <clears throat> I'll just end by saying, uh, what's the practical significance? Unfortunately, uh, politically, accountability is getting more remote with every passing month of inactivity. And it gets more remote the more that excuse me, Russia has diplomatic successes. It gets, it's remote in part because there's a tremendous suspicion of international criminal law uh, coming from the global south, which is something we can talk about in, uh, um, in the question and answers. And um, Gaza has displaced the Russian invasion of Ukraine as in the headlines, but um, more generally, I think that, uh, that there's a kind of crisis exhaustion everywhere that uh, that could lead to passivity. And I am not denying this. I'm, I'm not right now talking about the politics of accountability, which has always been an uphill stream. I'm talking about what the very nature of the crime is and what the law should be defining it as a crime. So let me stop there. Thank you very, very much, uh, David. Uh, this was a very, very rich and thought-provoking presentations about the four puzzles of aggression and accountability together with your own input. Uh, I don't know if our <coughs> participants saw my email, my, my message on chat. Ah, okay, I can see that there is already um, uh, uh, one question by, uh, by one of our participants, by Eva Vukovic. Uh, who asks, uh, oh, what about legitimacy? I think you mentioned about legitimacy. I was thinking about Tom Frank when you, you when you were talking about the, the internal process. So Eva asks, uh, what does an EU tribunal alone look like to the rest of the world? How will it be perceived? Accusations of double trust standards, something that you already touched upon, are very common now. She's writing from The Hague. I don't think, uh, she says that she doesn't think that fairness will do it to convince states around the world that this is a legitimate operation uh, and that this this claim of uh, this um, critique or suspicion regarding the legitimacy uh, it's something that cannot be dismissed so maybe you would like a little bit to um, to address uh, this uh, this comment yeah. further yes so i think uh, let's just start by distinguishing two kinds of legitimacy uh, for a tribunal external and internal the external legitimacy is a uh, buy-in from uh, a large number of members of the international community and here uh, my argument is that uh, we already have seen buy-in in the form of the um, not just the un general assembly twice denouncing Russian aggression in, in Ukraine by lopsided votes, but also something that was really unusual. Uh, almost immediately, 40 states parties referred the situation of Ukraine to the International Criminal Court. Now, usually you don't get states referring other states um, to the International Criminal Court. The court has no jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Uh, but it was pretty clear that it was the aggression that was the motivation for so many states to immediately uh, uh, Im immediately refer the situation. Uh, the case 
The Russian aggression is also in a kind of weird posture appeared before the International Court of Justice. Um, it was actually appeared as, uh, you know, what you might think of as an own goal by the Russian government. Uh, it accused the Ukrainians of committing genocide. And that allowed Ukraine to go to the International Court of Justice and say, uh, um, we've got a dispute under the Genocide Convention, and therefore you have jurisdiction. Um, the International Court of Justice immediately ordered as a provisional measure, stop the invasion, which of course Russia did not obey. But here we've got a lot of grounds, uh, and I, I think it was 30 or 40 states backed the, uh, Ukraine in uh, in the ICJ. So we've got a lot of external legitimacy in this case. Um, as a general matter, uh, tribunals for aggression would have to get that kind of legitimacy from somewhere. Um, so this might be a one-off case. Internal legitimacy is what I was talking about in the last couple of minutes of um, of my presentation, uh, that the tribunal has to be absolutely fair and it has to be scrupulously perceived as fair and by in the sense that um, uh, it's not just a, 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 a show court, a show trial with a predetermined outcome. Um, so there's an interesting fact about the Nuremberg Tribunal, uh, which is that um, the prosecutors at the first round of uh, Nuremberg trials were terrified that there might be some acquittals. They thought that that would delegitimize the tribunal. It turned out that there were acquittals and that legitimized the tribunal because it made it clear that the tribunal actually wasn't just a political show trial. Um, it, it actually had accused who were morally uh, you know, up to their necks in blood uh, who were acquitted of the crimes. So that's the internal legitimacy. Now, the double standard argument, I think, is uh, is also very important. Um, and I think that uh, when, when one has heard it, it's mostly, how come nobody did this when the United States invaded Iraq? Um, nobody was talking about the crime of aggression then. Well, um, I think there are a couple of answers to this. One is to concede that there might actually be a double standard. Um, but there are so many ways of distinguishing these cases. Uh, one is that um, there was no crime of aggression in the International Criminal Court at, um, at the time of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So there was really no tribunal to, you know, to even raise the question to. The second was that even though it caused an immense amount of disruption, suffering, and death, um, the United States was not trying to seize territory. It very swiftly restored Afghan sovereignty. Um, Iraq kept sovereignty. Uh, there was no effort to say, well, we're annexing um, Anbar province or anything like that. Um, and third, the level of actual war crimes committed by the coalition forces, while it was not negligible, was, uh, I would say, in the hundreds rather than the thousands or ten thousands, which is what we've been seeing in the Russian invasion, which has been extraordinarily ruthless. So there's ways of distinguishing this, but there's, there's no denying the fact that especially um, in the global south, where there uh, oftentimes Russia has been a, an ally in the initial liberation and decolonization struggles, and uh, the United States and other Western countries have been seen as uh, on the wrong side of history on those and on the wrong side practically. So there's a lot of old resentment. On the other hand, uh, there's something astonishing about this. Um, what's astonishing to me <clears throat> is that um, the moment that decolonization happened, states in the global south became the most jealous defenders of state sovereignty. And for very good reason. We don't want colonizers any longer. We don't want the Belgians to keep their heavy thumb on the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, we don't want uh, any 
of the old colonial governments to impinge on our sovereignty. And uh, actually at the time that um, there was this discussion of humanitarian interventions around the time of the Kosovo War, um, the Secretary General of the United Nations gave a famous speech saying maybe sovereignty is redefined now as not just uh, hands off, but uh, uh, sovereigns have a responsibility to protect their own people. Uh, and the pushback came from the global south, hands off our sovereignty, don't touch it. Now, you would think that there's a certain kind of double standard involved there, a certain kind of hypocrisy. We are the most jealous defenders of sovereignty in the world, unless it's Ukrainian sovereignty against an invasion. So I think that uh, you know, that the politics of the double standard is very complex. It's understandable, but uh, I don't think of this as a decisive argument against the legitimacy of an international tribunal for aggression. Thank you very much, David. I can see more questions coming in the chat. One question is from our colleague, uh, Mia Svard who is asking, uh, how do you weigh uh, the concept of use cogens versus custom? And if I can add a little bit on that from my own uh, question, uh, I, I was very surprised to follow all the discussion about neutrality after the Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine and how neutrality seemed to be an untouched concept uh, uh, during the last decade, despite all the other developments we had with aggression. So I, I was wondering how, whether do you see that there, whether you see there is a gap between sometimes they say what we teach, how we perceive what is the international law normativity and what actually happens with practice. And I will, I will go then to the next round of questions, if that's okay, if you would like to respond to that. You know, well, just very, um, very briefly there. Um, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, I mean, use Kogan's in some sense is, um, is a kind of super custom. You know, so that if you look at the where it first appears in, in the um, Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, it's a peremptory norm that uh, means you can't make a treaty that violates use code. You, you can't have two states saying we mutually agree to commit genocide um, or to launch aggressive war or to violate all international treaties. So, uh, the use Kogans rules that out, but it also says that, it, that the use Kogans could be replaced by a similar customary norm. And I think that this is probably a, a kind of holdover from a certain picture of international law, which is that there is absolutely nothing higher than law made by the states. I mean, there's no natural law that's higher. Um, so that you, the only way to conceptualize uh, the, you know, what you think of as the absolute worst crimes, the use Kogan's crimes, um, what, uh, the core crimes, um, is that uh, there's a, a strong custom. So uh, there have been examples of France, for example, never accepted the doctrine of use Kogans. Uh, there was a very interesting case about a decade ago where Singapore, which had sentenced somebody to uh, caning, uh, said, well, that it is torture. Torture is a use Kogan's crime. We accept that. But uh, use Kogan's doesn't trump Singaporean sovereignty. Uh, so, you know, the doctrine is, uh, I mean, I, in some ways, it's more of a slogan than a doctrine. I would take it as, um, uh, look, it's, it's there's good Good reasons why the things that we call core crimes are called that. There's good reasons why genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, aggression, torture uh, are the most serious international offenses. And that's the straightforward reason how awful they are. Uh, so does that, uh, you, know, you should take other questions. Yes, of course. Uh, I think some particularly students are interested in, in the cyberspace and, and the idea of cyber warfare. Uh, so I think there is one question re related to that and the, the definition uh, of aggression. What is your, how does the cyber warfare fit in with the definition of the crime of aggression? 
Oh, it's a very interesting question because all of this is so unsettled right now. Um, there have been efforts by international law experts who uh, uh, met in Tallinn, uh, Estonia, to create the rules about what count, about basically rules of cyber warfare. Um, there was, uh, they put out a document called the Tallinn Manual. Uh, then they put out a revision, Tallinn 2.0, and they are right now working on Tallinn 3.0. The kind of issue is this, uh, suppose that one state uh, plants malware in, uh, in another state's um, infrastructure, its defense infrastructure, or its civilian infrastructure that can be activated. Is, that's in some sense clearly a sovereignty violation. Is it aggression? And if you look at all of the acts of aggression that are both in uh, the Rome Statute and in its predecessor, which was the General Assembly's 1974 definition of aggression, none of them really fit there. So the, the question is, uh, how, how should we reconceptualize the notion of aggression and reconceptualize the notion of sovereignty violation for things that, uh, that are, are just so different from classic aggression, which is always physical use of force, you know, it's kinetic. And one thing that was agreed on was that uh, a cyber attack that has kinetic effects, let's say something that causes a dam to rupture and flood, can be treated as a kinetic attack and responded to in time. Uh, or in, in kind rather. Um, but the, the planting of malware, other things like that, that is, um, that's more, more difficult to conceptualize. Now, one of the big problems that's been reported in the negotiations uh, for Tallinn 3.0 is uh, a kind of dispute, um, is the rule of sovereignty a, a hard law rule? or is it just a kind of general blanket principle? And it turns out that the governments, like uh, particularly the UK government, has said, no, no, it's just a blanket principle. And it's pretty clear why. It's the um, states that have a, an advanced cyber aggression, uh, cyber offensive capacity uh, don't want to have it limited. So we say, no, 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 no. Even if it's a violation of sovereignty, there is no hard law rule of sovereignty, there's only this general principle and the principle is riddled with exceptions. And, and there, that's, that's been one of the focus of debates. It's fascinating to watch and I have no idea how it's going to come out. Thank you very much, David. Actually, we have Marco Milanovic uh, in February to talk about the drafting on Tallinn 3.0. Yeah, well, <laughs> and, he's, I mean, he's a, a, a wonderful scholar and a wonderful international lawyer. So that should be a very rich conversation. Yeah, I'm very happy that we we have we are very lucky to have you all in this series of webinars at the War Crimes Research Group. Um, I can see some co one more comment um, and uh, and uh, and. Uh, a common question, one comment is about the banks. You mentioned about the industrialists uh, in the Nuremberg trial. And there is one comment of one of our attendees uh, talking about um, the difficulty of prosecuting the aggressor him, himself or herself and the attempt recently uh, to go after the Swiss banks uh, that they support the aggressors. And, uh, and, and it's quite an interesting observation to think about alternative ways uh, as well of how law can be imaginative and litigation can be imaginative uh, in order to to to, to trigger um, uh, some developments and uh, results. So that's that's a comment. Um, and there is a question. Um, uh, <laughs> There is a question that uh, do, do, don't you think that the use of lawfare, lawfare through the manipulation of belligerents uh, can trigger uh, the I think it means can challenge the concept of aggression and as it is known in the field of international law. Um, so maybe you would like to 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 address some of that. Sure. Uh, on the first uh, one of the. Um, I would say both the strengths and the weaknesses of international criminal law 
is that it's always it, it has always been uh, only natural persons can be defendants. And that was controversial when the ICC first went online. Uh, and uh, the, the first prosecutor, uh, Luis Moreno Ocampo, uh, said, hopefully we will expand the Rome Treaty so that it can include corporate persons as well. Uh, now, there are, I think, uh, two reasons why it was focused only on natural persons rather than corporate persons. Um, one of them was uh, that you don't want natural persons who are responsible for a core crime to be able to hide behind the organization and say, it wasn't me, it was the organization. So let's, let's um, pull the, let, let's make sure that uh, we don't allow uh, a corporate entity to be the shield uh, as it, um, as it often has been. I mean, it, it goes, it goes both ways. Of course, sometimes the individual is a scapegoat. I remember uh, uh, when John Braithwaite, the great uh, criminologist was doing a study of corporate crime in uh, Australia. He interviewed a corporate officer who said, I'm, my job is the vice president in charge of going to jail. Um, meaning that if the corporation is indicted, um, I'll take the blame. You'll get, you'll take care of my family and give me a great job after I get out. Um, but so we only have natural persons. The second reason for that is that the um, not every not every country has a doctrine of corporate criminality, and all of the definitions of corporate uh, in corporate law might be different. So that was a kind of practical administrative reason. So let's just take criminal law off the table or international criminal law off the table. I think that the suggestion of going after banks through civil lawsuits, through national corporate prosecutions, if need be, is, um, is an important tool. And so I would completely agree with the comment that uh, um, that we shouldn't just limit ourselves to thinking uh, the only the only response to the crime of aggression is uh, criminal prosecution of individuals. <clears throat> now, on the use of of lawfare, um, I, I think I mean it's a very tricky concept. I mean, lawfare accusations are often used by malefactors to say, oh, you're just prosecuting me for political reasons. You're just using the law to stop me from doing what I want to do in an illegitimate way. And uh, you know, my own country has certainly seen a fair amount of that. I mean, we've seen it in uh, um, the events of the last few years, but also at the time of um, the Bush administration, the time of uh, when the war on terror terrorism began, and the Iraq invasion began, the US issued a national security statement in which it said the use of law against us is the weapons of the weak, just like terrorism. Okay, and so the idea is that calling us to account, how dare you Lilliputians try to tie down the giant Gulliver uh, by mere lawsuits, um, this is all political. Um, of course, the response is, uh, uh, you know, maybe you shouldn't be doing, maybe you shouldn't be committing international offenses if you don't want lawsuits and criminal prosecutions. I mean, you're calling it lawfare, um, but that's because you already think uh, nobody should be able to constrain me by law. So, you know, I, I think that uh, there there is such a thing as lawfare, which is frivolous and illegitimate complaints. Um, you know, for, I'll give a contemporary example. I think that the Nicaraguan complaint against Germany with respect to Gaza, uh, I mean, Nicaragua is not exactly coming to this with clean hands. It had just been the subject of a scathing UN report about how the Nicaraguan government is committing crimes against humanity, uh, against its own people. Uh, but it complained to the ICJ that Germany is violating the Genocide Convention by supplying uh, weapons to to Israel, the German government said, we don't do that. The kinds of things that we supply are not. Um, so I don't, I have no inside information about the factual basis of it, 
But I think that the complaint to the ICJ um, in that case is, you know, just kind of lawfare because it's, uh, I mean, it's very thin legally and it's coming from, I would say, a, a party that is not approaching with clean hands. Um, so maybe that's a, a twofold test of when the use of law counts as lawfare, that the, that the legal claims are thin and the party doesn't have clean hands. Thank you very much. If I can, if it's okay, I can ask one final question. I can see that we sure. don't have more questions. I, I, I'm going back to your first puzzle, uh, which is your refocusing on human rights uh, of uh, aggression. What, where is the evil coming from? And it's because it's a human rights oriented response based on Tom, like what Tom and Fred uh, have argued. And while you were talking, I was I was thinking about the general common 36 of the Human Rights Committee on the Right to Life that actually made a quite strong um, um, proposition towards that uh, direction that, uh, um, that the loss of life from an aggressive war is considered to be an ips ipso facto arbitrary loss of, of life, which, shows, which triggers some critique that after the humanization of IHL, we're going to even the humanization of use ad bellum. So I was wondering um, if you have any thoughts about that, if I can take this opportunity to ask you that. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with it. Uh, I'm not. So this is this tracks the debate uh, in um, just war theory on the philosophical side uh, between you know what people call the classical view that Michael Walzer offered uh, the crime of aggression. He argues his argument is more subtle than this, but it is a crime against states. It's more subtle because he thinks state here. That's not my real interest. It's the right of people to live in a self-determining state. So it's a human right. His is a, actually a human rights argument. But uh, the so-called revisionist school has said nothing, nothing that the invading, that the unjust side in a war does can count as legitimate. So uh, um, proportionality rules in, in Bellow, uh, if I'm the unjust invader, uh, none of my military advantages count on the plus side as compared with the damage that I'm done. And it seems to me that uh, that the general comment uh, 36 is uh, plump in the, the revisionist camp in just war theory. And uh, I think that um, that yeah, it's it's a little. I mean, thinking about this, one of the problems was uh, with uh, the revisionist arguments have been uh, that uh, um, they just assume that it's always easy to tell who's the just side and who's the unjust side. Uh, maybe that problem doesn't exist in general comment 36 because it says aggressor. It's not always easy to tell who's the aggressor. Um, in especially if uh, there there have been false flag operations, the uh, I mean World War II began with uh, Germany claiming uh, that uh, Poland had aggressed on it. Uh, it's a, this is a, a a false flag operation in which German soldiers dressed in Polish army uniforms uh, went around and shot up a German town. Uh, but. Uh, uh, you know, if we can identify something as a war as a war of aggression, then we might say that all killings are arbitrary killings. And I, I think the revisionist would be on board. And if I have hesitations, it's because I'm not sure that I believe in the revisionist paradigm. Okay, um, thank you very much. On that note, thank you very much, David, for uh, responding for this wonderful uh, webinar and for responding to 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 questions and and comments. It was a great honor to have you with us today from in London to have you from the other side of the Atlantic. And I would like to thank all of you. I want to thank once more Liz for her invaluable <laughs> uh, help uh, in organizing this event. Uh, I want to thank all our attendees, uh, our speaker. Hopefully we will see you in person sometime in London. I would love it. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. These are very, very 
interesting times, as, as we say. And um, we hope to see many of you here to our next uh, web webinar next week, which could be about the Moscow mechanism as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, David, once more. Thank you all. It's I have, a pleasure. Uh, Th thank, thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you for this very, very thought provoking discussion. Have a nice evening from London. A good day. Yeah. <laughs> thank okay. you all. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.